Welcome to worship at Beulah Presbyterian Church. And this has been quite a week, hasn't it? These past days we've been shocked and angered and have been filled with sorrow at the outbreak of violence in our world, particularly in Paris, but also in Baghdad and Beirut. And we grieve as we pray for those who have suffered such terrible injury and loss. So later on in the service during the prayer time, I'm going to offer up a special prayer that was put out by the Presbyterian Disaster Assistance by a woman named Lorianne Krauss. So we will want to keep this situation in our prayers in the days and weeks ahead. Now next Sunday, we are having what is called a Loaves and Fishes Day of Service. It should be a very fun day. First of all, Michael and Rachel Weller will be with us. The Wellers are missionaries from Ethiopia, and Beulah has supported them for many years. They will be presenting a special program about their work during the Sunday school hour in room 209. And then Michael will bring us the message in worship. So then after the service, we will have lunch. And then we will be packing food boxes for local families who have a shortage of resources this holiday season. And in the bulletin, there is an insert that lists some of the food items that we could use 
and uh, we invite you to bring those next week so we can pack the boxes. Also, we will be having a hanging of the greens, and what that means simply is that we're going to be decorating the church for Christmas because the 29th is the first Sunday in Advent. So it should be a fun day, and we invite you to make plans to stay and help out either in packing boxes or talking to the wellers or in hanging of the greens. And today is Faith Promise Dedication Sunday. And later in the service, you will be invited to come forward with your Faith Promise cards for 2016, as well as your tithes and offerings that you brought today. And so to encourage and inspire us, we have with us a special guest who came from heaven to give us a message, the Angel of Faith Promises. Did you notice that God gave me a new name? Let me explain. Faith is your belief or trust in God. And the promise is that what he has said in his word will come true. So faith is God telling you the truth and acting on it. Faith promise is your love gift to God through your time, talents, and treasures. Let's discuss some of those. Time. Have you spent your time learning about Beulah's mission projects and outreach programs? Do you know who your missionaries are? Do you know Kay Day? and the Wellers and others? Did you hear what, what Verona Presbyterian Church is doing in their community? Do you know that they help accommodate homeless families? Isn't that wonderful? And what about your youth and mission projects, their, their, their mission trips? Beulah is going to Haiti in February. Are you going? There are so many ways to spend your time learning about missions that you support. <clears throat> Talent. Did you discover your spiritual gifts? What gives you joy? What's your passion? Do you like to sing? Do you have music in your soul? Do you like to teach? Do you like to teach Sunday school? What about babysitting or, or serving? What about hospitality? Can you cook? And if you can't cook, can you make a reservation and take someone to lunch or dinner? That would be very nice. Can you encourage people? Can you pray? with someone or for someone and do you know that touching is so important that touching is a form of the gift of healing god gives you your spiritual gifts to serve others and in so doing you serve him treasures how did that tithing go? Did you give God his tithe? Did you know that tithing isn't how the church raises its budget? It's how God raises his children 
and you putting them first, putting him first in your life and in your heart. <sighs> God's people have a lot of excuses, so no more excuses. Do you know that God said that there, there were so many excuses that the people told him of why they couldn't be used? And maybe you can relate to some of these. Do you know that Noah was a drunk? Abraham and Sarah were too old. Timothy was too young. Leah, oh, she was ugly. <laughs> Moses had, had a, 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 a speech problem. Rahab was a prostitute. David had an affair and was a murderer. Jonah ran away from God, and Elijah was suicidal. Naomi was a widow, and John the Baptist ate bugs. Ooh. The Samaritan woman was divorced several times and was living with a man. Peter denied Christ, and the best excuse, Lazarus was dead. And Jesus used him to glorify God. So no more excuses. No more holding back from God. He wants to use all of you for such a time as this. Trust God. Even a small step of faith leads to a deeper, richer, more fulfilling relationship with God. And he promises to give every person in here a blessing to be able to give with joy. Say it with me. Give with joy. Please stand as you are able and join me in the call to worship. In the midst of the congregation, we will praise you. Rejoice in the Lord, O you righteous, and give thanks to God's holy name. We will extol you, our God and King, and bless your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised. God's greatness is unsearchable. Praise to you, Lord, the God of our father Israel, from everlasting to everlasting. Yours, Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the majesty and the splendor for everything in heaven and earth is yours. Yours, Lord, is the kingdom. You are exalted as head over all. Wealth and honor come from you. You are the ruler of all things. In your hands are strength and power to exalt and give strength to all. Now, our God, we give you thanks and praise your glorious name. You may be seated. Would you please join me now in our prayer of confession? There are many times we think we love you well, O oh God, but upon hearing your call to love you with all our heart and all our mind and all our strength, we confess that we have a divided heart. Our love seems pure only for brief moments. Soon our affections are drawn away. Forgive us 
and in grace rekindle our love to, for you. Hear the good news. Who is in a position to condemn? Only Christ. However, Christ died for us, Christ rose for us, Christ reigns in power for us, and Christ prays for us. Anyone who is in Christ is a new creation. The old life has gone, and a new life has begun. Know that you are forgiven, and be at peace. Thanks be to God. The scripture reading this morning is from 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verses 1 to 9. Paul is writing here to encourage the church at Corinth to give to the needs of the Christians in Jerusalem. He uses the example of the Macedonian Christians who gave in spite of the fact that they too were in poverty. Paul writes, we want you to know, brothers and sisters, about the grace of God that has been granted to the churches of Macedonia. For during a severe ordeal of affliction, their abundant joy and their extreme poverty have overflowed in a wealth of generosity on their part. For as I can testify, they voluntarily gave according to their means and even beyond their means begging us earnestly for the privilege of sharing in this ministry to the saints. And this, not merely as we expected, they gave themselves first to the Lord and by the will of God to us, so that we might urge Titus that as he had already made a beginning, so he should also complete this generous undertaking among you. Now as you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in utmost eagerness, and in our love for you, so we want you to excel also in this generous undertaking. I do not say this as a command, but I am testing the genuineness of your love against the earnestness of others. 
For you know the generous act of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, so that by his poverty you might become rich. This is the word of the Lord. Do you know the story of Millard Fuller? He was the founder of Habitat for Humanity. And by age 29, he was a millionaire, beyond a millionaire, because he was so ambitious and driven. But then in 1965, his life took a dramatic turn because his wife went to him and said she was leaving. But they decided to work on their marriage. And so the first thing they did was that they gave away their fortune to the poor and they devoted themselves entirely to God's work. So in 1976, they founded Habitat for Humanity, which has built or renovated well over 400,000 homes around the world and helped over 2 million people. So unloading all the trappings of wealth in Miller's experience really set him free. It brought back his family's love, gave him his health, a new purpose in life, and it gave him a deeper relationship with Jesus Christ. Today we're talking about giving. We're talking specifically about our faith promises. What will we give to God in terms of our time, talents, and treasure in 2016? And I really want to emphasize the fact that this is not just about financial giving, particularly in the area of our time, because in this day and age, our time is almost more valuable than our money, right? In fact, if you can pay for someone to do something, you will choose to do that rather than to do that task yourself. But when we think about time and our financial resources in particular, most of us are functioning out of what biblical scholar Walter Brueggemann calls the myth of scarcity. And that simply means that we believe in limited resources. We are always afraid there's never going to be enough, or we might not have enough, whether it is time or finances. And so this scarcity mindset brings about a lot of anxiety and fear, and we make decisions out of that anxiety and fear, because we're just afraid there's never going to be enough for today or the future. But yet, throughout the Bible, there is what Brueggemann calls a liturgy of abundance, where God's loving generosity is demonstrated over and over again. And we, as followers of Jesus Christ, who ushered in the kingdom of heaven, we are citizens of the kingdom. And Jesus, our Lord, is the one who multiplied the loaves and the fishes to feed thousands of people. So as citizens of the kingdom, we're called to live with a mindset of abundance, not scarcity. We believe in unlimited resources because we serve an unlimited God. And God's story is a story of loving, generosity, and overflowing abundance. So we need to exchange this mindset of scarcity and instead believe in the generosity of God and trust Him to provide for our needs. Now when Jesus talked about giving, He said, where your treasure is, there your heart is also. And so if our treasure is in God, then we will be giving out of love. Giving, therefore, is a matter of the heart. And in our passage for today, Paul is encouraging the church at Corinth to give out of love to the poverty-stricken Christians in Jerusalem. And he's using the example of the Macedonian Christians 
because they responded so generously to this need in spite of the fact that the Macedonians themselves were in great poverty. In fact, they looked at this opportunity to give as a privilege because they were so excited to be a part of what God was doing in another part of the world. So excited to be able to participate in God's work. And they also wanted to give because they looked at that as an expression of joy and an expression of thanks for all that God had done for them. They did not have a mindset of scarcity. They could give out of their poverty because they trusted God. But this morning, before we can make any promises about our giving of time, talents, or treasure for next year, there are two other giving steps that need to be taken first. Number one is we, first of all, have to give ourselves to God, give our lives to him through Jesus Christ. Paul said it, the Macedonian church in, of the, Paul said it of the Macedonian church in verse 5. They gave themselves first to the Lord. And so we are to give our lives to Jesus Christ, trust in him as Savior, Acknowledge him as Lord. And I know that many of us, if not most of us, have made that commitment to Christ. We've taken that initial step of faith, trusting in Christ as Savior. But when it comes to submitting to the Lordship of Christ, that is a lifelong process. Because as we grow in our faith, we realize that there are areas in our lives that we hold back from God, where we still want to be in control. It might be your career, it might be your plans for retirement, it might be your family, or it might be your finances. I know that finances is a difficult area for many people to relinquish control to God. I remember one leader in another church saying to me, I hope God never tests me in the area of money. And I think most of us do hope this because we suspect we might not pass the test. But if we're holding on tightly to our money or to our family or to our career, whatever it might be, then our hands are not open to receive what God wants to give to us. So we are to live in a posture of open hands to what God would give to us and where we have the freedom to give as he leads. So the first step before giving anything is to give our lives over to Jesus Christ. And then secondly, we need to give ourselves over to knowing God's will and being obedient. And again, using the Macedonians as an example, Paul said, they gave themselves first to the Lord and by the will of God to us. They gave themselves to the ministry of Paul and his co-workers and they agreed with Paul's request for them to give to the poverty-stricken Christians in Jerusalem. In other words, that was God's will for their giving. And so concerning the matter of giving, we must seek to know God's will for us in this area. What does God's word say? What, what instructions are there? What guidance does he give us? And then, where does he want us to give? So the second step is to give ourselves over to knowing and obeying God's will. And then, then we give in loving response to what Jesus Christ has done for us. Verse 9, for you know the generous act of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor so that by his poverty you might become rich. 
out of love for us, Jesus gave sacrificially. So Paul puts out the challenge to the church in Corinth. He said he was challenging them to give to test the genuineness of their love. He wasn't commanding them to give, but he wanted to see what kind of love was in their hearts. And it's out of our love for God that we are able to give generously. Last week, we talked about tithing and the fact that under the Old Testament law, tithing was mandatory. It was a command. Even if someone did not have the desire to give, they had to. But for Christians, love is the foundation of giving. We give out of our love for God and our desire to be obedient to what he's asked us to do. Someone once said, you can give without loving, but you can't love without giving. Love is the foundation for giving. And it's God who does that transforming work in us. The grace of God fills us so that we can give out of love. And this was one of Paul's main points in this passage from 2 Corinthians. God's grace was manifest in the Macedonians through their giving. Because when the grace of God takes root in our lives and in the life of a church, loving generosity is the result. Whether we're talking about giving our time, our talents, or our treasure. The Marquis de Lafayette was a French officer who fought on the side of the Americans in the Revolutionary War. And he was a close friend of George Washington's. But after the war was over, he returned to France and he resumed his life as a successful farmer. In 1783, the harvest was terrible and there were many throughout the countryside that suffered as a result. But Lafayette's farms were unaffected by the devastating crop failures. So one of his workers offered what appeared to be good advice. He said, the bad harvest has raised the price of wheat. This is the time to sell. But Lafayette, after thinking about all the hungry people in the surrounding villages, said, no, this is the time to give. This is the time to give, friends. God blesses us, not for our own benefit, but that we may be a blessing to others. And so, friends, may we give as an act of love in response to God's gracious love for us, shown in Jesus Christ. Amen. And now, friends, in this service of consecration, we invite you to come forward as God leads you and bring your faith promise cards for 2016 and your tithes and offerings that you brought today. I'll ask the ushers to come forward now with the baskets. And when you come forward after the prayer, I ask you to come down the center aisle and then go back to your seats by the side aisles. If you are unable to come forward, then after everyone has finished coming forward and putting their offerings in the basket, just raise your hand and the ushers will go to you. So now let us pray. O oh, loving God, we give great thanks to you as our creator. For you have given us life and you nurture us with your love. Because you gave us the gift of life, we bring our time to you. We bring our moments and our days as gifts to be used as you will. Because you gave us skills to work and create, we bring to you our talents, our gifts, and skills. Because you gave us financial and material resources, 
we bring our faith promises and offerings to you. Because you freely offered us redeeming love, we bring the gift of love in gratitude to you. So Lord, we ask that you would use these gifts, our lives, and this church as beacons of light in this dark world, helping to dispel the darkness and reveal your power and your light and your transforming love. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. I invite you to come forward. Let us go before God in prayer. God of mercy, whose presence sustains us in every circumstance, in the midst of unfolding violence and the aftermath of terror and loss, we seek the grounding power of your love and compassion. In these days of fearful danger and division, we need to believe somehow that your kingdom of peace in which all nations and tribes and languages dwell together in peace is still a possibility. Give us hope and courage that we may not yield our humanity to fear. Even in these endless days of dwelling in the valley of the shadow of death, we pray for neighbors in Paris, in Beirut, in Baghdad, who in the midst of the grace of ordinary life, while at work or at play, have been violently assaulted, their lives cut off without mercy. 
We are hostages of fear, caught in an escalating cycle of violence whose end cannot be seen. We open our hearts in anger, sorrow, and hope that those who have been spared, as well as those whose lives are changed forever, may find solace, sustenance, and strength in the days of recovery and reflection that come. We give thanks for strangers who comfort the wounded and who welcome stranded strangers, for first responders who run toward the sound of gunfire and into the smoke and fire of bombing sites. Once again, Holy One, we cry, how long, O Lord? We seek forgiveness for the ways in which we have tolerated enmity and endured cultures of violence with weary resignation. We grieve the continued erosion of the fabric of our common life, the reality of fear that warps the common good. We pray in grief remembering the lives that have been lost and maimed in body or spirit. We ask for sustaining courage for those who are suffering, wisdom and diligence among global and national agencies and individuals assessing threat and directing relief efforts, and for our anger and sorrow to unite in service to the establishment of a reign of peace where the lion and the lamb may dwell together and terror will not hold sway over our common life. In these days of shock and sorrow, open our eyes, our hearts, and our hands to the movements of your Holy Spirit who flows in us like the river whose streams make glad the city of God and the hearts of all who dwell in it and in you. In the name of Christ, our healer and our light, we pray. Amen. Susan, would you come and continue to lead us in prayer? Let us bow our heads once again before God. Heavenly Father, we come into your presence this morning as humble and gracious servants ready to follow your will. However, we can never adequately serve you through our own abilities, and for this reason, we continuously seek your divine guidance for our lives. Holy Father, we pray that you will bless the core foundation of our society, and that is your gift of the family. May you strengthen all parents to be responsible and loving so their children may grow in the security and the joy of a Christ-centered home. Likewise, would you touch the lives of our children and lead them to love and honor their parents through you and to be inspired to grow into your likeness. Guide each of us to be a reflection of you so that all people may experience your parental care through the respect and love we demonstrate to one another. We pray for our prayer families this week, for Andy and Becky McGee, and for Bob and Linda Andrews. May each family be richly blessed and comforted by your presence in their homes this week. Compassionate Father, you give rest to those who are weary with heavy burdens. Heal the sick in body, mind, and spirit. We especially ask your blessing upon our homebound members, Ed and Betty Messenger. Please administer to their needs and cares throughout the weeks ahead. Heavenly Father, we ask your blessing upon Beulah Church. We pray and thank you for Pastor Cynthia and her ministry over the past 20 years. May you continue to richly bless her as she follows your will for her life. We thank you for Beulah's staff members and ask that you bless the local communities that Beulah serves. And we thank you, God, for Ginger Bauer and for the Faith Promise Committee and the work that they have done over the past several months in preparation for Pr Faith Promise Sunday. May their work through you inspire the lives of each member here 
as we carefully and prayerfully consider the giving of our time, our talents, and our treasures for Beulah's ministry in the upcoming year. Mighty God, whose word we trust, whose spirit enables us to pray, please accept our requests and further those that will enhance your purpose for our lives. And now, let us continue together in prayer through the words that Jesus Christ taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. for the Beulah Barbershoppers. Let us pray. Oh God, we are so aware that all the blessings in our lives come from your hand. You are so good to us. Not only have you given us of material things, but you have given us your love, the love of family and the love of friends. And Lord, we thank you too for this church and pray that you would continue to use us and this congregation to reach out into our community and the world and bring the light and love of Jesus Christ. And now, by your Holy Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to the world. Through Christ our Savior. Amen. Now, friends, I charge you to go in the power and strength of our Lord Jesus Christ, ready to love because he first loved you and ready to give because he first gave to you. Be blessed as you go in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.
Yeah.